Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this edition of the Nonprofit Hub Hubcast. I am so fortunate to have good friend Stephen Shattuck online. He's going to talk to us about some uh, first-time donor retention, uh, which uh, is always something good to hear about. Uh, how are you doing today, Stephen? I'm hanging in there. How are you doing? All right. Maybe a little bit of cabin fever setting in today, <laughs> but... Yeah. But uh, we're 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 making it through, and it's it's always been good. As we were talking before we went on the air, we, I've been reaching a little bit deeper into my networks th this last week, uh, and it's it's been fun to catch up with some people. But yeah, with that, okay. yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm sure you'll um, uh, I'm sure there'll be a little bit of peppering in this about uh, maybe some. Some current events that uh, yeah. <laughs> will help people along, but I don't know what you're referring to, honestly. I don't even I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, we'll so. talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I don't want to take up any more of your time, Stephen, because I know uh, you've got a lot of great things to say. So I'll step aside and let's okay. get started. Cool. Thanks, Randy, and uh, thanks to all of you for for hanging out for an hour or so today. I know things are a little hectic. Um, but we're going to try to liven the mood and um, also give you some some tangible things that you can do today to to help retain your donors. And I'm going to kind of make the case for why we should be caring caring about first time donors, especially right now because we are in such a a, a unique and different fundraising sort of uh, climate than we were when we sort of first um, scheduled this webinar. But um, Randy, you know, we're kind of poking fun at it, but but I think that this topic is even more relevant now. And certainly there are lots of things you can be doing uh, considering what's going on with uh, the coronavirus and the, the economic situation that the country is in. Uh, so this isn't meant to take away from any of those things. You know, keep keep doing webinars, keep reading blog posts that have good advice about what's going on now. But uh, I also think you'll find that this is this is just as relevant to what's going on. So uh, a little bit about me, just real quick for context. Uh, I'm over at Bloomerang, uh, and if you've never heard of Bloomerang, we we are a donor management uh, software provider. You can check that out if you want on your own. I'm not going to talk about Bloomerang here, um, but basically my job over there, and I do a lot of other volunteer work, is uh, research and surveys and uh, some data analytics, and just just kind of keeping my my thumb on the pulse of what's going on with retention, loyalty, uh, donor engagement, things like that. So I'm going to share with you a lot of the research that that we're involved with, with directly, and that uh, I also kind of see coming down the pipeline from other sources. Um, and and we'll sort of translate that research into some tangible best practices for you. So why first time donors? Um, there's a lot of different things we could be talking about right now. Certainly and they definitely bear uh, a lot of importance. Um, you know, major gifts, that's something you probably wanna be concentrating on right now, making sure you're retaining that, that high level of support. Um, monthly donors, we just did a great webinar yesterday on retaining monthly donors, also very important. You know, certainly converting your in-person events into virtual events, uh, if they got canceled or if you're thinking about canceling them, that stuff's all great. Uh, and like I said, none of this is meant to sort of take away or divert attention, but first time donor retention um, is always important. And I'm gonna kind of make that case for you today, but uh, I, I was talking with uh, some some colleagues over at Donor Search this morning, and we were talking about first time donor retention. And, and just in the, in the course of the conversation, we kind of came to the conclusion that we're in sort of an interesting moment right now where a lot of organizations are acquiring first-time donors right now in the midst of this crisis. In a lot of ways, it's sort of resembling uh, Giving Tuesday, big online days of giving, and maybe even some disaster fundraising campaigns where there's a lot of generosity out there right now. My, my Twitter feed, my Facebook feed, maybe yours is similar, is just filled not with fundraisers asking for money, but with donors raising money and talking about how they are supporting the causes they care about because of what's going on now. There's a lot of people recognizing that food banks are shut down, animal shelters are shut down, lots of folks are going through some tough times. And I think they're responding similarly to how people respond to maybe natural disasters 
or other types of uh, disasters that, that happen every once in a while. And I think it's an interesting time for us to kind of capitalize on that and pay attention to those new donors who may be coming into our organizations for the first time because of what's going on right now. Um, so even though it's an important topic all the time, Actually, I, I'm also wondering if maybe some of you are seeing that influx of new donors and we want to hang on to those people. We want them to come back and give a second gift to our organization, because without the second gift, there's really a small chance that they are going to make gifts beyond that, uh, become a monthly donor, do things like major gifts, plan giving all of those good outcomes that we want to happen in terms of large gifts or maybe bequests, things like that, they have to start somewhere. They start with that first gift. Um, and getting people to go from their first gift to their second gift is tough. And I'm gonna kind of show you why I think that um, based on some research. We do have research into that, the Fundraising Effectiveness Project. They're this really cool think tank that looks at donor retention every year. Um, they've been doing it since 2006. Actually, now they release quarterly reports that we don't have to wait for their annual report ever anymore. Um, they're a neat collaboration between AFP and the Urban Institute. And what they do is they collaborate with many of the leading donor management software providers, uh, Bloomerang being one of them, other names you may have heard of, uh, Neon, Donor Perfect, even though we're all competitors, we actually all collaborate on this project. Um, and what we do is we send FEP our anonymous customer data and they crunch all those numbers and they release a report. Now every quarter, it used to be every year, but now it's every quarter on how well that cohort of nonprofits is doing at retaining donors. And this data set now is massive. It's, it's in the billions of dollars in annual transactions. So it is a pretty, um, a pretty good piece of, of the overall nonprofit pie uh, in terms of how we're doing. And I'm excited to give this webinar because I have brand new data for you, data that is just out this past week. I think you, you folks may be the first people to see this. If you're watching the recording, don't feel bad. Um, you can always go to afpfep.org and see the most recent data. But if you follow Bloomerang, if you follow Nonprofit Hub, you'll, you'll probably see that. But where we are right now is about a 45% donor retention rate. So on average, we are retaining about 45% of our donors, which is actually up. It was 43% last year. So we're, we seem to be doing well, at least from 2018 to 2019, at retaining those donors. This is 2019 data. I know it's 2020 right now, but this is looking at the 2019 calendar year. It's always a, about a half a year behind. Um, but the reason for this presentation is that first time donor retention rate is only 20%. So we lose eight out of 10 of all of our first time donors, people who have only made one gift to our organization, their first gift. So this is low, right? This is, uh, this is bad. Uh, if you are losing 80% of your new donors um, only for them to never give again, uh, there are so many ways that this can kind of compound for your organization and, and hurt your bottom line. We'll talk about those things. But you can see if you can get that second gift, if you can get a repeat donation, those retention rates more than triple to 61 uh, and, and a third or so percent. And then if you can get a monthly commitment, those retention rates are really high above 90 percent. But bridging that gap between first time and repeat donation is, is tough, right? But I'm gonna give you some ideas of how you can make that happen specifically uh, within sort of the current uh, fundraising climate that we find ourselves in. And one thing that we're sort of concerned about over at FEP is that that first time donor retention rate uh, has been on the downswing over the last five years. Uh, since we've been looking at it back in 2015, it was around 25% and now it's dropped a full uh, five percentage points to 20.3%. Um, so there are a lot of theories on why this is happening. No, nothing that is certainly proven or data, data backed by any means. My personal theory on this, and I think you'll see why I, I feel this way later on, is that it's never been easier to become a donor for the first time. 
right? Sort of that technical barrier of entry to donating to us as nonprofits um, has, has lowered, right? You can click that Facebook donate button. You can donate through PayPal, through your mobile device. Certainly the rise of online giving, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, I think is a big lever of this, which is good. All those things are good because the cost to acquire donors is also coming down. But I think sort of the double-edged sword of that is that it's hard to hang on to these people because it is so transactional. Um, and especially on the digital channels where maybe we don't get a lot of the donor information if, if we get it at all. Um, so we kind of have to balance the, the good and the bad there with more, more donors coming in, but it becoming increasingly difficult to hang on to them. And I alluded to this earlier, but if you don't get that second gift from a new donor, you may actually lose money on that transaction. If your cost to acquire a donor is higher than the donation amount that they gave you, you've got negative ROI right off the bat. And I know that it's, it's, it's hard to kind of calculate your exact cost per acquisition for an individual donor. But if you, don't, if you do get the second gift, you can rest assured that you've got positive ROI uh, regardless of what that cost is. So kind of getting that second gift, I, I think is more important than the first gift in a lot of cases, because if you are spending money and trying to get them to give again, only for them to never do so, you could even lose more money on that transaction. One thing that we're really concerned about at FEP is the recapture rate. So this is the percentage of people who lapse and then come back to your organization years later after lapsing. And similarly to the new donor retention rate, this has been falling over the past five years from around 6% to now just below 4%. So only 4% of your lapsed donors are ever gonna come back to you and give again unless you are proactive. And we're gonna kind of talk about what are those, those things that you can do to be proactive. But if you're sitting there wondering, well, you know, so what if they don't, if they miss a year or two, you know, we can get them back. Well, it's really hard. It's really hard to get someone to come back after they've lapsed. And this is sort of the financial uh, ramifications of your overall donor retention rate. So this is that 45% uh, on average donor retention rate um, what does it mean if you can improve that number? I know this is a super busy slide, but basically all it's doing is comparing an organization with a 41% retention rate versus one that has a 51% retention rate. And you know, 10% difference doesn't sound like very much, but you can see that organization that's at 51%, they're raising about a half a million dollars more from those retained donors. Now that's all donor types, that's not just first time donors, but um, we did the math on that and we sort of crunched the numbers here to see what would happen if you went from a 20% first time donor retention rate to a 30% donor first time donor retention rate. And I know, again, that doesn't seem like that much, but at a certain gift amount with a certain amount of donors, so here we're looking at a database of 500 uh, new donors, each giving on average $200. Well, if you can improve your retention rate by just that 10% on the first time side, that's about a quarter of a million dollars, that 234 grand there in the bottom right-hand corner. So a change in these retention rates, even a small change, can really mean a lot of money for your organization over the lifetime of those people being involved with your organization. And this is just money, right? This does not count People may be fundraising for you, volunteering for you, maybe serving on a board or a committee, um, doing all these other things for you that tend to come along with being retained over the long term. And we actually created a, a, a you can actually go into this spreadsheet and plug in your own numbers. Just visit that link at the bottom of this slide when you get the slides and you can see for yourself what that would mean. You know, what's your database size? What's your average gift amount um, in terms of new donors? and see what that change would mean for you. So just a small improvement, like I said, can mean a big difference. Sometimes Bloomerang customers will like email me or, or tweet me and say, hey, you know, we went from this retention rate uh, and we got a, a couple percentage higher. And I get excited for them because 
I know what that can mean for, for their bottom line. Other sort of interesting data on uh, the second gift specifically, this is a study from the analytical ones, um, not, not an organization that we're involved with. I just happened to see it uh, over the course of sort of my research. They found that, um, and we've got Bloomerang research to kind of back this up, which I'll get into in a second, but they found that the faster you acquire the second gift compared to the first one, the higher the gift amount of that second gift. So what this is sort of alluding to is that there is sort of a honeymoon period among those new donors, specifically leading up to the first 90 days. So we're recording this on March 25th, which means that new donors from your year end campaigns and maybe even going back a little bit into the month of December to Giving Tuesday, those folks are still in play. So I know we've talked a little bit about new donors in the midst of this coronavirus crisis, but don't be afraid to go back to new donors from maybe Giving Tuesday of 2019 till today, because they are still in that honeymoon period. It's okay to ask for that second gift within the first 90 days of getting the first gift. In fact, we've got some other research to back that up. So you don't have to wait. And in fact, I don't think you should wait a year or maybe even longer to try to re-solicit that new donor. Um, as long as you do some very specific things within those 90 days. And we're going to talk about what you should do in the first 90 days of that research. And if you weren't convinced yet that uh, these donor retention rates matter, well, uh, Jerry Panis, who uh, actually invented the term moves management, he coined the phrase, um, he found that amongst all of the thousands of bequest donors that he had generated for his clients, the most frequent attributes of those bequest donors weren't necessarily age or wealth or even childlessness, although those things are definitely strong signals for bequest likelihood. He found that the most frequent bequest donors were people who had been retained by the organization long-term, regardless of their gift amount. So like I said in the beginning, if you want things like major gifts, plan gifts, bequests, monthly giving, you got to start somewhere. And that all starts with getting the second gift from those new donors. Um, more ammo for you if, if maybe you need some to convince maybe your board or your boss to, to focus on stewardship. Well, getting uh, a second gift should be easier and more cost effective than getting that first gift. So the renewal costs are much lower uh, than the acquisition costs and um, as well as the response rate and the, um, the speed in which you can get those people to renew. Um, so, so why is this happening? Why do we have 20% new or new donor retention rates? Um, and maybe more broadly, why are we at a 45% uh, average donor retention rate? Well, we've got research on this. There are there have been in the past many, many donor loyalty research studies done. Uh, Penelope Burke does one every single year. Uh, Jen Shang out of the UK is looking at this. Adrian Sargent, of course, he's sort of the godfather of donor retention. He did one of the first studies. It was kind of a landmark study on donor loyalty, just trying to figure out why lapsed donors suddenly stopped giving. And the answers probably won't surprise you. Um, you know, they weren't told how their gift was being used. They weren't thanked or maybe thanked appropriately. They received poor service or communication. About you know, 30 to 40% of those lapsed donors, they stopped giving because of reasons that are kind of controllable by us as an organization. You know, of course, donors want to be thanked. Donors love to receive those stories on who is being helped by our organization. Um, and they don't want to get things from us that, that don't really make a lot of sense for uh, the type of donor that we are or maybe where we are in the relationship. And certainly there are, there's really not much we can do about donors passing away or maybe donors going through financial difficulties. But I think we certainly can do a better job of thanking and reporting on outcomes, especially for first time donors. I feel like those donors should kind of rise to the top of the priority list um, to get those types of communications as well as some other things that we'll talk about that I'm gonna kind of recommend you do in those first 90 days. Um, we have 
lots of other research on why donors stay loyal, not as not not just why they stop giving, but why they keep giving. Um, I love this donor voice study. I, I, if you've attended a webinar I've done in the past, you, you've probably seen this before. Um, it's just so empowering for fundraisers, in my opinion, for how we should approach donor communications. They basically found the top seven reasons for why loyal donors keep giving. It's because they receive those stories and they expect your communications and they're not kind of caught off guard with, by them. They are thanked quickly, they're thanked personally. Their feedback is solicited, you know, maybe sending surveys to donors or calling them up and asking them questions or inviting them out for a tour or a coffee. Um, and always making sure that all of those things are done in a donor centric manner. So what I've kind of done for you in, in the second half of this presentation is kind of reverse engineer these concepts for how you can employ them or deploy them specifically for first time donors. How can we make sure that new donors to our organization get thanked quickly, get told stories, on not just right away, but on an ongoing basis? How can we kind of let them know what it is they are gonna be receiving from us in the future? Because again, this is a brand new relationship. We kind of want to set the stage for them and tell them, hey, this is what we're going to be sending you. This is kind of what you can expect from us. Um, how can we get to know these folks? I think oftentimes we suffer from a little bit of a lack of curiosity, perhaps, about our new donors. You know, they're new to us. We're new to them. Let's get to know them. Let's proactively reach out to them and find out what it is makes them tick and make sure that they have an open line of communication if they ever have questions for us. And then how can we secure that second gift within the first 90 days um, in a way that is sort of personalized and contextualized the appeal that is for that brand new donor? And how can we kind of wrap all that up into a very donor centric package? So that's what I wanna cover in the, in the balance of my time here. And I think as you, you'll, you'll notice as we go along here, it doesn't just have to be first time donors that get these things from us. Now, how we package it for first time donors will be unique for sure, but these concepts should apply to your monthly donors, your long-term loyal donors, peer-to-peer -peer donors, everyone that supports you volunteers, you'll wanna sort of deploy these concepts, but we're gonna kind of focus first on what your plan should be for those new donors. And I think the first step is, have a plan, have a plan of action for what it is you're gonna do whenever you get a brand new donor. I think ideally, you know, kind of alarm bells should go off in the, in the organization for when a new donor is acquired. I, I think it's a time to celebrate because you've just convinced a brand new person, a, a stranger in some cases, to join your family. That should be celebrated. And I think it should also kind of kickstart a plan, a documented plan, which of course will have some, some room for, for customization depending on the circumstances, but that should sort of activate um, and kind of kick into gear so that you can start stewarding that brand new person. So my main piece of advice, if, if you do nothing else other than what I'm gonna talk about on this slide, you will be ahead of most nonprofits in terms of their communications. So my suggestion first is that your, your thank you letter uh, for new donors or thank you letter process or whatever it is you do to thank donors, whether it's a letter or a phone call or a handwritten note or an email, that piece of communications should look different than all the other thank yous you send out for existing donors, um, you know, in-kind donors, whatever the other types of donors are. You should be unique in how you are communicating to those new donors. And I'm not talking about a, a very drastic difference in what that letter or email looks like. If you do nothing else other than recognizing that they're a new donor, you're in business. That's, that's really all you have to do. Now you can go deeper and we're going to go deeper here in a minute. But if you get a new donor, that thank you letter should recognize that they're a new donor. You know, hey, Randy, thanks so much for your donation. You know, notice it was your first donation to us. Wow. We're, you know, we're so we're so happy that you're joining the family of donors and that you trust us with your, your hard-earned money. 
we can't wait to tell you, you know, about all the great things your donation is going to do over the next 12 months. Um, and I'm not a great copywriter. You probably already surmised that, but that should look different than maybe your thank you letter to someone that's been giving to you for years and years that also recognizes that support. You know, hey, Stephen, thanks so much for your donation. Wow, you've been giving to us since 1997. You are, you know, the heartbeat of this organization. Your support has been so valued. You've done all these great things. And then, you know, whatever you say in the letter. So that's what I would recommend to you is you sort of draft maybe in your database or in whatever communications tool you're using, a very specific new donor acknowledgement that is different from all the other ones you're sending and that only goes to new donors. Now, you can do that differently. Like I said, it can be a letter, it can be a phone call. Maybe you say, hey, we're gonna call all of our new donors. I think that's an excellent idea and I'm gonna kind of tell you why I think that's a good idea. If you have a phone number, of course, I'm, I'm not recommending that you go out and try to find people's phone numbers, but you can see that I've split this segment um, by gift amount. So if you have a high volume of gifts, specifically new gifts, which is a good problem to have, I suppose, and you know you can't call every new donor, you can't write a handwritten note to everybody, well, you might want to prioritize people who give above your average gift amount. You know, maybe those are the people who you call, the people in this top left-hand uh, quadrant. And then the people who are in the bottom left-hand quadrant, maybe they just get, you know, a nice letter in the mail that is tailored to new donors for sure, but maybe they don't get a phone call or a handwritten note just because you're, you're a little pressed for time. But, you know, a new welcome kit, uh, a dedicated new donor letter, that's what I recommend you do first. And then you can kind of keep going down the rabbit hole if you want. And, and this is an example of kind of the extreme uh, end of the spectrum, although it works very well for this organization. This is one of my favorite customers at Bloomerang. They, um, I think they are aspiring to try to break Bloomerang. They, ha they haven't been successful yet, but uh, they have all of these segments for different types of donors, not just new donors, and repeat donors, but also lapsed donors, um, you know, super loyal donors who have given multiple times within a year or within the past year. All of the communications to those people look different and sort of address the type of donor that they are. You know, hey, we would love for you to consider supporting us for the first time versus, wow, welcome to the family. You know, you're a new donor. We can't wait to tell you all these things versus, hey, you've been giving to us for years and years. We're so grateful for that support. And not only do they do that based on the frequency of the donations, but also kind of the persona type. So that's kind of the vertical axis here where um, they're a school foundation. So they have parents of current students. They have parents of former students who have graduated, grandparents of both, uh, the alumni themselves. So all these letters, these dozens of segments, they all kind of read differently, and again, not drastically differently, but they sort of address the type of person that they are. And this pays dividends for them. This is one of our most successful customers in terms of retention rates. They have high retention rates, uh, high revenue versus other organizations kind of in their similar uh, cause type. And I think it's because they communicate to different types of donors differently. And a main cohort for them are those first time donors because they recognize, hey, we gotta do better than a 20% retention rate. Can we get to 30, 35%? That can mean a really big impact. So what should we do with these folks? What should that actual segment of communications look like? Well, we talked about this before in the donor loyalty research, but the faster you think a brand new donor, the better. And I, I know this may seem overwhelming with all the things that are going on here and, and all, the, all the tasks you have, not to mention your services, but again, this pays dividends maybe more than a lot of the other uh, fundraising activities that we, we tend to do that maybe aren't as high value. Um, if you can get to new donors in that first 24 to 48 hours and say thank you, that has been shown to really increase retention. Um, McConkie Johnston found that retention rates quadruple, so they go from 20% to 80% if you can thank a new donor personally, that's the keyword, 
within 48 hours. So personal is a phone call, it's a handwritten note, it's a one-to-one -one email where you know you're literally opening up Gmail and Outlook and writing a custom email to them. That's not a template letter, you know, that just kind of spit out of your database and put in the mail, which it would be kind of hard to get that in their mailbox within 48 hours. Um, but personal. And Penelope Burke found that if a board member calls a new donor within 24 hours of that gift, not only can you assume the retention rates increase, but uh, their second gift size also increases by 40%. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, like, geez, Stephen, I, I can't call every new donor, I can't write all these handwritten notes, try to get other people involved, specifically board members. Board members are awesome, awesome people to steward donors in general, but particularly new donors, you know, they can call them up, say, hey, hey, Randy, this is Steven, I'm a board member here um, at the Bloom Rank Foundation. Just wanted to say thank you for your gift. I noticed it was your first gift. You know, we're so happy to have you in the family of donors. Um, I'm here to answer any questions you might have, you know, get in touch with me. This is kind of an example of a voicemail, but if they pick up the phone, and not a lot of them are gonna pick up the phone, voicemails are just as good, but if they pick up the phone, that's an opportunity to maybe ask them questions. Hey, why did you give? You know, what drew you to our cause? And you may get some information from them that will help you communicate to them going forward and probably uh, increase the likelihood that they give again because your donor communications are gonna hit a, sp a certain mark that you didn't know about. And there, there was a research study that was kind of skeptical of this, but we actually debunked it over at Bloomerang. We looked at um, a, a, a small cross-section of our customers who uh, were active in calling their new donors. They were following this advice. Um, and we found that compared to customers who weren't calling their donors, they were having much higher retention rates on that first time retention side. So everyone was around a 33% retention rate, but the organizations who called new donors, they, they went up to 41%, which again, if, if you're kind of saying that doesn't seem like that much, remember my spreadsheet before, that's a lot of money. Uh, potentially. And if they call donors multiple times within the 90 days, um, almost a 60% retention rate uh, for new donors, which is re really good. That's getting close to all donor types compared to the FEP average. Um, we also found that um, if they called those new donors, uh, this also corroborated that analytical one study I showed you where they gave sooner um, they actually gave within 53 days um, versus organizations that were all waiting almost about a year, maybe two two thirds of a year to get that second gift. And that second gift size was higher if they received those thank you phone calls within the first 90 days. So there's a lot of research here basically all saying the same thing that if you call new donors, it pays dividends, especially if you have board members call them. Um, so, that's one of the reasons this is a quick boomerang plug we uh we built that into the product so if a new donor does come to your organization we alert you and we sort of encourage you to call that person um, and if you're using our mobile app you can do it right there from your phone or have a board member do it uh, or assign it to someone else in the organization so that's the first 48 hours well we've got a lot more time to be communicating to that new donor through sort of that first year of their engagement. And what I recommend to you, and I kind of alluded to this before, is have a plan, document what your first time donor communication plan is gonna be within the first at least 90 days, but I would maybe go out further into almost a year. What are those new donors gonna get from you? When are they gonna get it? And who is going to be sending it? Um, within the first year of that of that new relationship. This is a sample template. This is from uh, our buddy Lori Jacob with. Um, you know, you can download this from her website. You can kind of clear out the cells and, and write in whatever you want. But a couple, couple reasons I recommend this. One, you'll hold yourself accountable, which is good. You know, if you say, hey, we're gonna call every new donor within three days. You know, we're gonna send them a tour invitation within six weeks, we're gonna send them a survey whatever that thing is, this will help hold your team accountable. 
I think the even more compelling reason is this is sort of a way to insulate your new donors from other types of communications that may not be appropriate for them right now. So when they're on this sort of track, they're not getting anything else other than what is on this spreadsheet. So why is that important? Well, let's pretend for a moment that um, it's, we're recording this on March 25th. Let's say I donate to you on March 25th. I'm a brand new donor. I make my first donation. I give you 25 bucks because you know I saw on Facebook that, hey, you know times are tough or whatever you needed to support. So I gave. Well, if your spring appeal is scheduled to go out on March 30th, and that may actually hit my, my inbox before I actually get thanked for that new donation. And this happens a lot where, you know, they get kind of thrown into our donor database and they just kind of get lumped into whatever ongoing campaign may have been previously scheduled or already ongoing. And they may get things from us that are totally inappropriate for where they are in our relationship. So the value of having a plan like this is you're kind of putting them in a little bit of a bubble um, so that they're only getting the thank yous, the stewardship pieces, you know, the tour invitation, the new donor survey, that specific appeal that is only for new donors within the first 90 days. Remember, that's not too soon. We've got some research that shows that's a good window to do it. That's all they're getting. They're not gonna get anything else that maybe you're sending to loyal donors, existing donors, monthly donors, whatever the rest of sort of your database looks like. So have a plan for your internal purposes, but also for the benefit of kind of protecting that new donor from thing, from getting things that maybe are not appropriate for them right now. This is another plan you can check out from Pamela Grow. Very similar, very heavy in the first 90 days on thanking the donor, getting to know them, a welcome kit, a survey, um, I love the tour invitation also early on. I don't want to kind of gloss over that, but tours are great for new donors. I know that that might be hard right now because a lot of us are under quarantine, um, but, you know, maybe a virtual tour, if you can somehow get um, something like this, maybe a webinar or a webcam, and maybe you can kind of take people behind the scenes. Um, but when things cool down, maybe you want to have, uh, you know, the new donors from that month come on site or maybe go out to a project or go off site if, if you're just in an office building that doesn't make any sense for a tour. They're great because they will see your mission in action, which is good because we saw from the previous research that they wanna know who was being helped. But again, similar to the phone call, if you get them in person, you're gonna have small talk with them. You're gonna chit chat, you're gonna get to know them. You might be able to find out why they care about your cause, why they donated, what that connection is, and then you can use that information when it comes time to ask them for that second gift. Just another sample plan here. I, I like this one. I know it's a little unfair because Goodwills have a lot of volunteer support, but they don't segment by by gift amount. You know, a five dollar donor gets the exact same thing that a thousand dollar donor gets. So, you know, don't necessarily judge that new donor by their gift amount. I know that can seem tempting. If you have a high gift volume or if you're otherwise, you know, can't get to every single new donor, then for sure concentrate on the higher gift amounts. Um, but just keep in mind that new donors don't always give at capacity and you never know who may be there. Um, then, you know, looking at our thank you letters, our thank you emails, you know, just kind of recognize that they're a new donor, right? Be very donor centric, uh, centric, let them know that uh, they are doing awesome things out there in the world. Um, even if it's a, a print piece, you can still be very creative. This is a welcome kit I got uh, from a, a school here in Indy where I'm, where I'm talking to you from. I, I think this kit is just ingenious. For one thing, it does at the top what I, my number one thing, which is to recognize that it is a new donor, that it's the first gift. If that's all you do in that specialized thank you letter, that's okay, that you're way ahead of most people. But I think this, this piece sort of ingeniously um, bridges a connection between the donor and the service recipients, the kids at the school. So first gift, 
And first day of school, first field trip, first chapel, those first experiences of the donor making a connection that's very contextual and kind of creative between the donor and the service recipients. And then you can see there was a little insert that invited me in for a tour to see your gift at work through a personal visit or a tour. Please contact us. Create, steal that sentence. That's perfect. Um, maybe not send it out right now because not a lot of people are going to take you up on that offer. But again, this is going to go away eventually. So maybe start planning now. Hey, how can we do some tours maybe in the summer or the fall when people are back out and about? But tours are great for first time donors, really one of my favorite things. Um, one to one emails, you know, not just sending that uh, automated email from your database or even from your, your MailChimp that goes out to all your donors. You know, this is, a, this is an example of an email I got where I started a new monthly uh, commitment. Not only was I a brand new donor, but I started a monthly commitment. And I got this nice personal email from the director of development, uh, the CEO, they CC'd him just saying, hey, welcome. You know, thanks for joining the monthly donor program. You know, it's gonna do so many great things. And I made you a quick thank you video. And it was a video made just for me. It was just Mike talking into his webcam totally disposable video, you know, only meant to be viewed by me and probably only viewed once that just said, hey, Stephen and Leah, you know, thanks for becoming a monthly donor, you know, just blown away by that, by that commitment to us. Just wanted to tell you a quick story on what monthly donors do for our organization. And I actually called Mike up because he's a customer and I had never seen these. And he told me that this is one of the, the most high ROI um, exercises or tasks that he does at the organization because he can track the retention rates and the upgrades and lifetime value from donors who get videos versus those who don't. And he sends a new, he sends a video to every new donor, especially monthly donors. Um, and they love doing it and it, it blows people away because it's, it's very unique in terms of kind of the, the cold transactional stuff that we typically get. Speaking of online giving, uh, we got some interesting retention rates. This is also brand new data. This is from the, the chief scientist over at Blackbot. I just saw this on Twitter yesterday and I put this in the presentation um, where they found that the retention rates on offline gifts tend to be lower than multi-channel gifts. So when, we, when multiple, you know, direct mail, online, email, social media, all those things come into play. And I think personally, the reason for that is when you give online, it tends to be a very impersonal kind of transactional experience. You know, you've got these boring thank you pages. Sometimes you get these scary receipts that are automatically generated from like PayPal or your payment processor or whatever it is you're sending. You know, sometimes they don't even make it through spam filters. My homework for you, one of my homework pieces is donate to yourself online and see what it is that you are sending um, automatically from these sort of robots and websites that kind of control the communications. Because if this is what you're sending people, keep in mind that if it's a new donor, these are the very first things they're ever going to get from you as an organization. What can you do to maybe spice up or warm up um, the thank you page? and that automatic email. Um, I donated to this organization and uh, re a, a few years ago, and I, I use it as an example pretty often, but I think they do a really good job of stewarding those online donors right away and in an automated fashion. Anyone who donates online, they get taken to this thank you page, which kind of stands apart from this one, which doesn't really say much of anything, but this one, there's a nice thank you video. You're kind of taken on a virtual tour of the facility and then it's quickly followed up by this automatic email that again is just sent automatically from the payment processor or the database whatever they're using that looks like a nice thank you letter right it doesn't look like that boring receipt or you know scary transactional message it's got photos it's got donor centric text it does everything that the research says. You know, it says what the gift is going to do. It previews for future communications, makes the donor feel really good about what they're doing. So keeping first time donors in mind, you know, this is what you want those new donors to see 
especially if they're giving online for the first time versus something that is kind of scary and transactional. And then you've got to like just recover from it in your thank you letter or a phone call or whatever it is you do. Why not just get that, you know, stewardship started on, on the right footing and everyone benefits from this, not just the first time donors. But I, th I think that's why the, the online retention rates are so much lower is because so few organizations do this. So go into your software. If you can customize these things, customize them, warm them up, you know, put some photos in there um, and, and kind of leave the transactional stuff for maybe that tax letter that you send out later. Uh, get to know donors, especially first time donors. This was the number four uh, highest signal of donor loyalty. It's that these loyal donors said that the organizations they support, they care what they think. And I think the, the first way you can do that is to get to know new donors, you know, and maybe a new donor survey that goes out to every new donor that gives to you maybe this week or this month, get to know them, be curious about these people. Like I said, why do they give? How did they find you? Why do they care about what, what you do? The answers you get are going to help you communicate to them going forward. And you're not going to get a hundred percent response rate on these surveys. No, that's not the point. But you know, maybe the 10 or 15 percent of people who do respond, first of all, that's a strong signal that they responded anyway. But the information they give you can be worth its weight in gold in terms of communicating to them going forward. So I'll give you an example. So let's say you get two brand new donors today. They both give online and they both give $50. Well, on paper or in your database, those two donors look exactly the same, right? They both live in your city. You know, they they may even demographically look similar if you've got some data on that. But if you go a step further and ask them, hey, why did you give? You know, what's what's your interest in the cause? What drew you to us? You may find that those two people are very, very different despite kind of looking the same on paper. And you might want to communicate to one differently than the other. And again, not wildly differently, but maybe it's a, a specific newsletter preference um, or maybe one story that you send out may be more compelling than another. You know, maybe one of them had a grandparent who died from the disease you're, you're fighting versus another one who was maybe maybe just moved in the moment by a Facebook ad or, you know, heard you on the radio or something like that. You might want to communicate to those people um, differently for sure. If you use Bloomerang, we actually automate that for you. you. There's a new donor survey tool that just surveys every one of your brand new donors and asks them those questions. Um, but you don't have to stop at just why they gave. You can also ask them questions like, hey, how are we doing um, communicating to you? Did we thank you fast enough? Um, you know, What do you expect out of us in the future? Do you kind of trust us to produce outcomes for you? There are lots of, lots of questions you can ask you know, if, if you don't use Bloomerang, that's okay. You should still be surveying donors. We've got an ebook about surveying donors um, on this slide. Just click that link when you get the slides. Free ebook. You don't have to fill out a form to get it. You can just get the PDF right away, and it'll kind of guide you through this process. I know I'm just very quickly glossing over it, but you know, we could probably do a whole 10 hours on surveying if we wanted to. Um, one other thing you might want to look for, kind of on the same thread of donors that may look similar but actually be very different is among your first time donors you may want to segment that group one level deeper and look for two specific types of donors within that group that's memorial uh, and peer-to-peer -peer donors so those first time donors you may want to communicate to differently than all of your other types of first-time donors, which is probably just going to be direct to you. You know, they gave online, they answered a direct mail piece, they came to an event, whatever that is. But memorial and peer-to-peer, -peer, that may seem weird that they're lumped together, but the similarity there is that there was some third-party fundraiser who who asked or or secured that gift on your behalf. So maybe it was a bereaved family member who chose your charity uh, as the charity that folks could donate to through the funeral home um, or a peer-to-peer -peer campaign where 
someone who really likes you, you know, goes out on Facebook and says, Hey, I'm running, I'm raising money for, you know, the food bank here in Indy, um, you know, please donate where that, that donor, even though the money went to you, they may have primarily been supporting the friend or the family member who chose you. So how you communicate to those donors, I think should look a little bit different, you know, certainly acknowledge, Hey, thanks Steven for donating to Randy's peer to peer um, campaign on Facebook the other day. You know, we're so grateful that he chose us uh, to support and we are so grateful that you chose to support him and by extension, our organization. And what you have to do there is don't assume that that donor knows what you do or cares what it is you do. You may actually have to re, sort of reintroduce yourself to that donor as if sort of you're acquiring them for the first time, even though they technically donated to you. But what I've seen work really well, and some Bloomerang customers do this, is they will actually involve the fundraiser in that act of thanking. So sometimes the thank you letters actually come from the fundraiser and not the organization, or maybe they've, they're written by the fundraiser, but on sort of the, the organization letterhead. Um, you know, hey, Steven, thanks so much for donating to my 5K. By the way, the nonprofit I chose to support where your money went to is this organization. And this is the reason I chose them. And I would love it if you would consider supporting them in the future. You know, here's all the info. You know, you're going to get their newsletter. Be on the lookout for that versus what most people do is they just kind of swoop right in as the nonprofit and just send that thank you letter to the donor and don't acknowledge the campaign or seek to kind of explain who they are. They just sort of act like their best friend, um, whereas that donor may not know anything at all about the nonprofit. So segment, you know, this presentation really is about segmentation at its heart. You should be saying different things to these donors even though they're first-time donors, they should look differently than other types of first-time donors. But here specifically, and, and hopefully your database can kind of segment these people out for you, um, but you may want to take kind of a different approach to these folks than other types of first-time donors. Um, I love the phone. I, I think the phone is the secret weapon, honestly. You know, we talked about all that research I showed you, and it's, it's good timing. Uh, honestly, you know, we're all kind of stuck at home. It may be hard for you to send mail. It may be hard for you to send a handwritten note. Um, obviously, email is good. You know, if you can send a nice personal one-to-one -one email, like that video email I got, that's good too. But if you get a new donor and they give you a phone number and you didn't ask for the phone number or require the phone number, I'm kind of thinking of an online donation form where the phone number field is there, but it's not required. If they give you a phone number, I would call those people, especially first-time donors. You saw the research says it's effective, um, but I think it'll also stand out in this kind of you know very impersonal world that we're living in. We're getting bombarded by solicitations, you know, email, you know, text messages from political campaigns and you know the the stores down the street. And that's all good. I'm not saying those people should stop that necessarily, but to get a thank you voicemail just kind of out of the blue, I, th I think will stand out and be kind of rare uh, amongst all the other communications that people are getting. And maybe you're sitting there wondering, well, you know, I don't like to be bugged by, by the phone. I don't like that. That may be true, but that may not be the case of the, the preference of all your donors. And if you get a donor that says, hey, don't, you know, thanks for this, but don't call me. That's okay. You know, take them off the call list. That's okay. But I, I think that if you try this and if you're willing to be a little bold um, in, in picking up that phone or maybe getting board members to do so, I think you'll find that it, it is an effective uh, use of your time. Um, and like I said, voicemails uh, are just as good there. Don't go out and try to find people's phone numbers. You know, don't call their, their business line and try to get to them through the switchboard. That's not what I'm saying, but let them self-select into it. If you get a phone number, call those people, you know, just say, Hey, thanks so much for becoming a donor. Just wanted to say, thanks. If you've got monthly donors, you know, I, I would recommend maybe reaching out to those folks. Now you don't want to lose that support. 
just pick up the phone, just say, hey, Stephen, thanks so much for being a monthly donor. Just wanted to show our, our quick gratitude, you know, recognize that ongoing support you're giving. And it's just so appreciated. You know, that's all you have to say. It doesn't have to be this big complicated thing by any means. Um, and if, if you're feeling overwhelmed, I get it, but concentrate on this quadrant, those new donors who give you more than typic your typical gift amount. Um, because new donors don't usually give at capacity. Um, so, you know, don't let the gift amount drive you too, too much, unless you do have a really high, high gift volume. Um, Penelope Burke found that among major donors, about 70% of them were also giving smaller gifts to other organizations. And it was because they weren't really engaged. Maybe they saw $100 and thought, well, you know, it's only $100. We got to concentrate on these big donors. Well, big donors got to start somewhere and, and stewardship can really help that. So just kind of be careful if you're segmenting by gift amount. Um, so that's it for me. I, I know we're almost out of time and maybe we can do a couple of questions, but Hey, have a plan for the new donors, you know, prioritize them. I know there's a lot of, a lot of people in your list and your database that deserve attention, but to improve that 20% number uh, in terms of retention, that can, that can really mean a lot of good things for you. Um, get to know them, you know, be curious about them, find out why they gave, why they care about you. Uh, the information can be really, really valuable. Um, talked about the phone um, and don't be afraid to ask for that second gift within 90 days as long as you do those stewardship things I recommend now if they give and they don't hear from you at all in the first 90 days and then they suddenly get asked again may not may not respond to that very well but if they've been thanked you've gotten to know them send them some stories you know some client photos a video whatever it is I think that that first that or that that ask within 90 days is going to be much more effective. Um, so if you're curious about Bloomerang, you know, check us out. Um, we're pretty easy to find on the web. You can you can see what we're all about. You can watch a video demo. Um, the main thing I do for Bloomerang is all of our uh, research, our resources, our case studies. We've got a really robust library uh, of things there: eBooks, templates. We've got our own webinar series. Uh, we're doing a webinar uh, on Friday, uh, going to be talking about uh, COVID-19 specifically. And speaking of COVID-19, we have put together a special uh, resource library on our website uh, that has webinars, podcasts, templates, examples, specifically for how uh, folks might want to communicate right now, um, considering what we're all going through. So check that out. Just visit our website. You'll find it real easy. And that's all free, you know, all educational, don't need to be a customer at all. Um, so Randy, I know you got cabin fever, but uh, if you're still there, I'm, I'm happy to take some questions if there sure. are any. Well, You've been doing jumping all, jacks for the last hour. <laughs> first of all, while, while I was listening in on you, of course, I always learn something, even though I've heard <laughs> you speak a, a, a few times in my life, I always <laughs> learn something. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, I should totally be doing that. But I was writing thank you notes actually while you were, <laughs> while we Good were talking. Good idea. And I, I received a random gift in the mail. Um, that, oh really? Yeah. So how exciting, it came to my desk while I was sitting here. Wow. <laughs> we do have a few questions. Okay. Um, and also, also, by the way, you are a machine. Like you already <laughs> have all of those resources out online. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> we love it. Well, I mean, we kicked it into gear because our customers were asking and we just said, hey, why, not we, why don't we just make it publicly available because everyone else is going through the same thing. So we're happy to That's do it. Awesome. All right, so uh, let's see, Valerie says, it looks like most of the numbers and approaches you are sharing are geared toward individual donors. And by the yes. way, side note, I should have made $1,000 in the number of times, or I gave away $1,000 probably in the number of times you used my name in the presentation. Well, <laughs> you, you're, always, you're always top of mind. So thanks for being my, my best pretend donor. <laughs> um, she, uh, but Valerie says it's geared toward individual donors, but she imagines that these principles and suggestions apply to corporate donors. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. Sides. Yeah. And I think that's where board members can come even more into play because your board members are probably part of the corporate world. Maybe they're higher ups at their organization. So maybe for a board member to reach out to like the CEO of your corporate sponsor and say, Hey, I'm a board member of, you know, Bloomerang foundation. 
I just wanted to thank you for, you know, sponsoring our event or for, you know, doing the employee matching, you know, from kind of one CEO to another. I think that would be really, really powerful. And in corporate sponsors, especially event sponsors, they they really go under under supported. Um, another thing you might want to add in that may not apply to individual donors is social media. So it can maybe kind of be hard to recognize one donor on social media, although you can do it. But to recognize a sponsor, their marketing and PR people are going to love that. They're going to reshare the post. It, the CEO is going to love it because they like the publicity um, for being a supporter. So I think social media could be uh, another sort of secret weapon in in supporting these organizations beyond all the other things that I talked about. But yeah, a lot of it still applies for sure. All right, uh, here's another question. So if you're if you're trying to show your donors what their dollars make possible, but you have multiple service lines that range yeah. in age from preschool to seniors, do you just choose a service or wh what are your thoughts on that? So if you get an undesignated gift or if they don't give to a specific fund, you can still tell an impact story, but in kind of a generic way where they don't necessarily think their gift got designated. So, you know, hey, Randy, thanks for donating. Um, you know, notice you were a new donor. Just wanted to tell you a quick story about someone who recently went through our program. You know, he's he he's the first kid in in his family to graduate from high school. And it's all because of donors like you. And I can't wait to tell you more stories like that in the future. And then if you add in that survey piece, you know, an aspect of your survey could be, hey, we have a wide service offering. What are you interested in? Are you interested in seniors? Are you interested in teenagers? You know, if you're an environmental organization, you could say, hey, do you care about wildlife? Do you care about public lands? Do you care about legislation? You can ask what it is they're interested in in terms of um, the service offering. And that doesn't really touch on designating the gift necessarily. So don't be afraid to maybe add that in to your surveys um, if you do do a lot of things. But if you're if you're pretty hyper focused, you know, if you're an animal shelter, yeah, I think you can basically guarantee or, or you know, rest assured that they care about dogs and cats. So you're probably on 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 good footing there. But if you got a lot of things going on, ask them, ask them what it is they're interested in. All right, this question may be timely more than anything, but is it okay to send an invitation to a video chat to thank a first time donor? Yeah, I would do it. I would try it. Um, and if if you can't, if they say no, or if maybe you don't have that technology, um, I would do, you know, maybe a one-to-one -one video. So um, we did, I'm gonna go back to this one. So these guys, they use a, a tool called Vidyard where it just connects to your webcam. And you just speak into your webcam and it saves the video and it generates a link that you can just shoot out um, to them. So, but I love the idea of a video conference in lieu of uh, a tour or maybe meeting with them in person. So maybe you call them, send them a nice thank you, send them a nice email. And in that thank you, you maybe say, hey, if you'd ever want to jump on a quick video chat, and just talk for a few minutes, ask me questions, you know, feel free to schedule that. And maybe you could do like a Calendly link or some sort of scheduling tool. And again, you won't get a ton of people who accept the, the invitation, but the ones who do, that's, that's maybe a future, you know, big time donor who accepts that invitation. So I think it's definitely worth trying, um, especially if maybe there's, you know, somewhere you can kind of show them if maybe you are still going on site but other people aren't able to come see you. I think that could be a, a great alternative to uh, a tour that it's probably gonna be impossible for the next few weeks or so. Yeah, I'm on a board at a, an arts organization. It's a playhouse and mm, uh, they're, they're, they're doing social virtual tours right now just to keep, you know, just keeping people, keeping them on the minds of, of their donors right now. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Um, we're a little bit over time, but people are not dropping off and, you know, <laughs> I think everybody has time and if you have time for one more question, we'll send it yeah. out. 
I'm already at home, so I don't need to leave it for anywhere. So this is great. <laughs> yeah, I'm you here. Get, you got daycare taking care of. Everything is fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't heard any any crashes downstairs. I think it's okay. <laughs> All right. So regarding board members calling to thank new donors, are thank you notes from board members just as effective, or is a call the best practice? Most. I think I think um, I haven't seen any research comparing them. There is that Penelope Burke research about about calls. Um, but if you can't do calls or if they don't want to, or maybe it's just too weird for whatever reason, I think it's a good fallback, honestly. You know, I, I, I wouldn't be discouraged if, if you did handwritten notes over phone calls. You know, anything is better than, you know, just that kind of boring templated thank you letter that, that may get signed by the ED or may not. Um, but, but board members are, are powerful uh, advocates for us because they're volunteers. You know, they probably have busy lives and they've got other things going on and, and they can also speak to why they support. So I, I think the real power is not necessarily the channel. If you can communicate in a handwritten note that I'm a board member, this is why I support the organization and I wanna thank you for also supporting. I think if you can kind of tell that story that's what makes it powerful, not necessarily that it's a certain channel versus another. Okay, there's there's another question here from Karen about an ED just got on the job and they don't know mm -hmm. if the, the records are accurate or not. And, um, yeah. and you know, we don't know if they're a first time donor or not. And I would just say, because I've been in this position before in my life, <laughs> as if, I mean, treat them as a first time donor, but maybe not say first time donor. That's the way I would look at that. Yeah, I totally agree. I would <laughs> just say you're your yeah. first time donor. That's true. Personally. Um, yeah. And you know what you could do, Randy, is if she's new, they could say, hey, I'm, I'm the new ED. I just wanted to introduce myself to you. And if you ever have any questions about us, you know, I, I would love to get to know you. So that yes. that may be the opportunity rather than kind of tiptoeing around what what kind of donor they are um that that could be a that's a that's a good reason to reach out if you have new new leadership um yeah. being, and, you know, down the, being new gets you down the road six eight months easily abs oh absolutely <laughs> oh my gosh yeah and you know go, going back to the other question you know maybe you offer hey if you ever want to have a video chat or talk to me, you know I, I would love to do that that you know we could kind of combine a couple of the ideas from the questions for her. Um, but yeah, I yeah, would do it. I would reach out to him. Right. When I got into a new position, it was toward the end of the year and I mm. called someone because it was a sizable year end gift and, and it doesn't matter how, you know, it didn't matter that it was sizable, but it was, it was sizable enough that I was like, I got to call this person all, immediately. And I wow. called, left a message and they called me back and they were just so excited for the new direction of the organization. And um, Great. I'm, I'm sure I sealed that as a more long-term donor for sure. Yeah, and you did it right. I don't know if right. they were a first-time donor or not, but I just called and made sure it happened. <laughs> there you go. I love so, it. Well, hey, Stephen, thank you so much. It's time for you to take off your work hat almost and, uh, <laughs> and walk downstairs and, and put on your dad hat. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, this was awesome. Thanks for having me and, and you oh, know, seeing certainly. Seeing two or three hundred people, whatever it was, that I know you're all are busy and it's hectic. So I, I appreciate you you listen to me, Gab, and, and show you bar charts and boring stats and all. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's never boring. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks so much, Stephen. I hope to see you soon. Yep, I will. Hopefully, it, right. it'll be, we'll be there before you know it. <laughs> yep, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> bye bye. See you guys. Thanks everyone for joining us.